We are a nation hooked on pills and medicinal quick fixes. Our health service spends billions of pounds on drugs that we might not need. The food hospital is the first of its kind, dedicated to treating illness solely through food. Pioneering this radical approach are three medical professionals who will treat conditions ranging from diabetes to depression and migraines to menopause. The Food Hospital is on the front line of the Food as Medicine revolution. This week's patients include a woman whose chronic body odour has taken her to the brink. At one stage, I was borderline suicidal with it. A teenager who has to confront his crusty eczema. Can you open up your finger just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. There you go, look at that. I've never seen it this close, this is disgusting. <laughs> and a mum in agony with gallstones. I've been through child labour and I'd have that any day over this sort of pain. <laughs> plus how to deal with a hangover. I'm feeling pretty fragile this morning, to be honest. I'm a bit shaky. Still feeling rough now. Just need a cuddle. And Dr Pixie McKenna will unearth the truth about the things that claim to be good for us. Do health claims on packaging make us want to buy more expensive food? And can we even trust the claims they make? First through the doors is a patient traumatised by a rare condition. My name's Ellie James, I'm 42, I currently live in Bristol and I have trimethylaminuria, which is also known as Fischoda syndrome. Hormones, illness and diet can all determine our particular smell, but for Ellie it's much more complex. I emit a variety of odours such as sulphur, ammonia, burnt rubber, rotting garbage and marzipan. Trimethylaminuria, or fish odour syndrome, is a rare condition where the body loses the ability to break down a compound in certain foods. This causes the sufferer to give off unpleasant smells, ranging from fish to faeces. Living with this condition is often socially isolating and can result in depression and other psychological problems. It's not just that it's smells revolting, you can be spreading a smell for 15 feet. If you're in a small room or you're on public transport and you're having an episode of this, you'll see people start rubbing their noses um, because you are literally gassing them. Their eyes water, they cough, they sneeze. For some people, symptoms are intermittent, but Ellie's are constant. You stop going out in public, you don't want to go to the shops. I've been through the bullying, I've left jobs because of this. I've really, really suffered, actually. Um, at one stage, I was borderline suicidal with it. I went to several GPs, none of whom knew what I had. Most suggested I had a mental health problem and that I was imagining it. After 11 years of living with this condition, Ellie only recently got a formal diagnosis. Like many of us, she went online to research her condition. When she read that her odour could potentially be managed through diet, she took the extreme step of cutting out all but a handful of foods. I haven't had any professional proper advice about my diet yet. It's hit and miss, it's trial and error. Ellie's restricted diet is dominating her life, so she's come to see GP Gio Maletto for some advice. Ellie, you have a condition called fish odour syndrome otherwise known as TMAU, which stands for trimethylaminuria. Trimethylamine is a compound that's produced by the body and normally got rid of very quickly by an enzyme. Trouble is, in your case, you don't have enough of that enzyme, so it's not got rid of, it builds up, and it's released in the saliva, in the breath, in secretions of your body, yeah. in the vagina, the skin, yeah, everywhere. Uh, and the urine, and it's very, very smelly. There is no cure for Ellie's condition, but by limiting or avoiding foods that are high in a nutrient called choline, found in fish, milk and red meat, it is possible to minimise the constant smells. I've researched what foods are high in choline and completely cut them out. 
Um, and that has probably cut my odour by about 70%. But I'm worried about it because I don't understand enough about the food connections, perhaps to make informed decisions. What would you like to achieve here? I want to feel that I'm not in a food prison anymore. I'd like food to be pleasurable again. Ellie's self-treatment may be partly controlling her odour, but the food hospital's dietitian Lucy Jones has studied her restricted diet and has some major concerns. So Ellie, talk me through the, the changes that you have done. Um, I've cut out pretty much everything. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I've cut out coffee, chocolate, all proteins, all animal products dairy most things actually so an easier question might have been tell me what you eat yeah <laughs> normally i'll have strawberries and apples and pears um that's usually breakfast lunch and tea are usually soup made from a combination of carrots apples cucumbers sometimes peppers um that's usually it and has your weight been affected by this diet um yeah yeah i've lost three stone since I was diagnosed and I've lost two stone in the last sort of 10 months or so. After cutting out all foods containing choline from her diet, Ellie is more than a stone and a half under her ideal weight. It doesn't sound like you're having a lot of fat and obviously the overriding thing is protein, mm. goodness. Yeah. The female body has a finite need for protein, you know, 45 to 50 grams a day minimum. If you don't eat that, your body is going to break down your muscles in order to fuel that need and all the major organs in your body are made of muscles so it's going to be damaging weakening your heart potentially you could be at risk of cancer osteoporosis even things as simple as as your gum health and your teeth health mm. i'm guessing that your relationship with food must have crumbled um yeah it's not good um i'm afraid to eat right. um, but i'm constantly hungry so i'm constantly obsessing there must be a wider range of food I can eat. I think there has to be, because you will not have a long life mm. if you continue on the level of dietary restriction mm. that you're having at the moment. Some foods are thought to increase body odour in all of us, such as garlic, onions and spicy foods. But for people with fish odour syndrome, foods like fish, red meat, egg yolks and beans are also a no-go. You've accessed a lot of information on the web but not all of it complete yeah. and so because of your fear you've always taken the cautious route which has left you just unable to eat anything and actually loads of these foods you can eat safely. I want you to be able to eat cottage cheese and I want you to be starting to have egg white omelette. Oh that would be great. Yes and that there's no great. reason why we can't do that. Lucy wants to put Ellie on a low choline rather than a no choline diet. The aim is to control the odour but gradually reintroduce some foods Ellie has chosen to cut out to increase the essential nutrients her body needs. I knew that restricting my diet so much was going to cause problems with things like osteoporosis, but I justified that that was a decent trade-off. I had no idea I was causing long-term damage to my internal organs. That was a major shock, quite a wake-up call, and it's made me realise that although I'm short-term managing my symptoms, this is not the way to do it. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna and this week I'm looking at the science behind these food health claims. Health plays a big part in food marketing and the emphasis on health is very obvious when you go out shopping. You've got bread, which keeps your heart healthy. You've got fruit juice packed with antioxidants. You've got fish fingers full of omega-3. You've even got cereal that claims to lower your cholesterol. Do health claims on packaging make us want to buy more expensive food? And can we even trust the claims they make? Would you be prepared to pay a little bit extra to buy a food that had a health claim attached to it? Yes, I suppose I would to a certain extent. Yes? Yeah, yeah, you would? I, mean, I think it's important to read the label. I do tend to buy things that are, are kind of aimed towards like low cholesterol and all that kind of thing. And if it's just a little bit more, I'd be inclined to buy it compared to not going for the healthier choice. It seems like many of us are prepared to pay more for proven health benefits. I'm off to meet the editor of The Grocer magazine to find out why health claims in food and drink make us feel that they're worth paying extra for. 
do you think making your packaging look healthier means you can charge more? Absolutely. Clearly, a packaged good like the one uh, in the box, there's more room for messaging and they're pitching it in terms of the cholesterol savings and lots of messages on there around saturated fats and no added nasties and so on. The other product here is much more functional. It's clearly pitching it in terms of just get this and get on with it. Part of the reason that you're able to charge more is because you've got more room to say more things about the product and to sell the added value. But can we trust these claims? Does food always do what it says on the tin? Later I put food health claims on packaging under the microscope. Will this cereal lower my cholesterol? The next patient into the food hospital is a 16-year-old with an unsightly and painful condition that affects around 1 in 5 children and 1 in 12 adults in the UK. My name is Toby Mortar. I'm 16 and I suffer from eczema. When it's at its worst, there's like a constant burning sensation in my arms and my hands. I've experienced some name-calling, slight bullying because of my eczema. When it's really, really bad, if I'm at school I pretend to be sick so I can go home. Red, dry, inflamed and itchy, eczema can make life miserable. Severe cases may be difficult to cope with physically and mentally, often having a significant impact on daily life. I feel that eczema does take over my life. I can't do anything without eczema being prevalent. When I wake up in the morning, there's blood on my covers because I've been scratching the night and I haven't realised it. My dream is to become cabin crew, but I don't see that happening if I've still got eczema because I wouldn't want somebody serving me chicken or beef with some eczema-ridden arm and I don't think I'd want to be that embarrassed every time I'm working on a flight. The exact cause of eczema is unknown. It can run in families, but it also seems it could be linked to allergies and the immune system. I've tried so hard to do something about my eczema, um, but I go to the doctors and they just say, just keep on using the creams that you're using. Just want some proper help. Every year, the NHS writes out millions of prescriptions for steroid cream treatments for eczema. Toby's come to see Geo, hoping for a more natural approach. Toby, you're here because you've got eczema. Uh -huh. uh, when did that start for you? Um, since I was, like, two. So let's take a look using the microscope. Here's the very dry skin around it. And we're looking, this is in between your fingers, isn't it? Yeah. You can see there, you've got these golden, crusty lesions and that kind of wetness. Can you open up your finger just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. There you go, look at that. Oh my God. <laughs> I've never seen it this close. This is disgusting. <laughs> so that's staph infection. Mm -hmm. So bacteria on the skin have got into the skin where it's inflamed mm -hmm. and colonised it. Eczema is a chronic inflammatory skin condition that most typically appears on hands, feet and the skin creases, such as folds of the elbows or behind the knees. Is it very itchy? Uh, yeah, really, really itchy. So that's a typical characteristic of eczema, is that people scratch it, the scratching makes the inflammation worse, and then bacteria that normally live on the skin can get inside the skin and cause infections. So there's a bit of a cycle. Yeah. The thing with eczema, a lot of the time, is that you don't really cure it. It's just a question of managing yeah. it and controlling it. I've tried creams, I've tried everything under the sun, nothing helps it. Less than one in 10 children have trigger foods which make their eczema symptoms worse. At 16, Toby is on the cusp between adult and child. Whilst conventional medicine says there's no proven link between adult eczema and diet, Geo is sending Toby to an allergy specialist with a dietary approach. I do believe that um, your symptoms by and large are reversible. Um, if we are to look into the area of uh, foods, the best shot we have at it is to exclude a number of common foods from your diet for a couple of weeks and see what response you get from you. Dr Econs has devised an elimination and challenge diet for Toby, excluding certain foods to see if his condition improves. If it does, he can then reintroduce one food at a time to see if it triggers an eczema breakout. In a nutshell, I would like you to avoid, to start with, the most common foods. For two weeks, Toby will avoid all grains, dairy foods, 
yeasts, citrus fruits and chocolate. Can I have a look at the menu, see what they, they look like? Thank you. He'll limit his diet to meat, fish, seafood, veg, salad and pulses. Elimination diets are a method believed by some to uncover food allergies, but they should only be carried out under medical supervision. We know that in around 10% of children, an exclusion diet can improve eczema, but it's not actually been proven in adults. So it'll be quite interesting to see what happens for Toby. The Food Hospital is committed to improving the health of the nation, but it's also here to investigate the healing powers of food when it comes to the damage we inflict on ourselves. Johnny, Billy and James are students who love to go out drinking. Over the course of a weekend where you've got a weekend off, then anything can happen. The whole weekend is essentially based around sort of drink as much as you can and just love to get out there and just be smashing it all the time. Well good. They have at least three binges a week, sinking up to 10 pints a time. This is way over the recommended 21 units a week for men. Yeah, see ya, Mara. <laughs> and for every big night out, there's the morning after to endure. The lads have come to the food hospital after last night's session to see if they can minimize the stomach churning effects of their hangovers. When I get out of bed, Massive head rush, headache, dehydrated, don't want to look at food, that's my hangover. My headache sort of goes away after a while, but the queasy stomach sticks around so most of the day. I'm feeling pretty fragile this morning, to be honest. I'm a bit shaken and you just want to crawl back into your pit and sleep. Still feeling rough now, just need a cuddle. Although drinking to excess isn't advisable, many of us have experienced hangovers. Dehydration is responsible for most of the nastier effects of booze, the parched mouth, headaches and continual dizziness. Alcohol irritates the stomach lining, which accounts for the nausea and indigestion. And since your liver is working overtime during the night, it means you're likely to wake up totally lacking in energy. All right, lads, what happened to you last night? Yeah, we went out and had a few quiet pints last night. I mustered about 10 pints of cider. Right. Just on the cider, these two started on the lager. Yeah, and then moved on to the rum at some point and it sort of went downhill from there. Many people reach for the coffee after a heavy night, but the caffeine could mildly dehydrate you further. And sugary drinks may give you a quick lift, but half an hour later you'll come crashing down. Hair of the dog may seem like a good idea at the time, but it only postpones the hangover and can be the first step to developing a real dependence on alcohol. So let's talk about some things that perhaps might help. Okay, the first thing we've got here is milk. Milk has a substance in it called cysteine, which is an amino acid. It's basically one of the building blocks of protein and you actually need it to metabolise alcohol, particularly if you have with it a banana. Bananas are lovely and high in potassium, as well as having the extra sugar in. A bit more slow release than things like sugary drinks because they've got fibre in, so that's going to help slow it down and give you more of a sustained response. And the potassium is something that we lose in our wee when we've had diuretics like alcohol, so it's good to replace that as well. So as well as the milk, cysteine is actually in things like cheese, yoghurt, eggs, and even things like bacon and sausage. And so that brings us nicely on to our magic healing hangover breakfast. So the old tale about a fry-up is half true. <laughs> the ingredients are good, but they technically shouldn't be fried because of the fat. So a nice, healthy, grilled, cooked English breakfast is actually a pretty good hangover cure. Drinking water is good for rehydration, but Gio and Lucy have a more effective remedy. Another really great thing to start your day with if you're hungover is an oral rehydration solution. Water with a bit of added sugar and salt. So in like a pint of water, you'd have about four teaspoons of sugar and about half a teaspoon of salt. Now we've made you up an extra special one today using maple syrup for our sugar, a bit of lemon juice because it tastes good and it's got some vitamin C, and the salt. We've also added a little bit of honey to go along with the maple syrup. So the thing about this uh, drink that we've made up, the reason it's better than water is because there's a mechanism in the bowel that if there's a bit of sugar around in the water, it actively takes up water into the body, much more so than if there's just regular water around, which is why this is very effective. And it's used as well in travel medicine, so people 
people that go abroad and get diarrhea, for example, this is a really good way to rehydrate. It's not that bad, is it? It's quite salty. The salt is going to basically replace the losses that have occurred where you've been weeing a lot. It's like main course and dessert all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> 20 minutes later, has Lucy and Gio's simple homemade rehydration drink done the trick? It was sort of going down, it felt a little queasy, but then obviously now it's sort of, it has settled the stomach quite a fair bit and my head's feeling a little clearer. So I'm, I'm guessing it's doing its job. I'm feeling quite awake now, so it's brought me around a little bit. It doesn't taste the best, but sometimes the things that don't taste the best are the best for you, so. Yeah. Yeah, you've uh, got to go through the, uh, the pain to get the reward, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ellie self-prescribed her own extremely limited low-choline diet, trying to manage her fish odour syndrome through food. But Lucy is concerned that Ellie is becoming seriously malnourished as a result of this. And because her condition is so rare, Lucy is sending Ellie to University College London to see a leading expert in metabolic medicine for specialist support. We start off just by talking about trimethylaminuria and what it is, and then move on to how we can treat it. Uh, then we can come back to how that applies to you and what you're doing at the moment. Dr. Lackman and his team have devised a food plan which should reduce Ellie's body odours and also give her the essential nutrition Lucy was so concerned about, decreasing her risk of serious health problems. Basically, we split things up using a traffic light system and we have red foods that really contain quite large amounts of choline you should try and avoid. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the spectrum, there are the green foods which you should be able to eat pretty freely. After two and a half years of her harmful, restricted diet, Ellie's new list of safe foods includes egg white, sausages, oats and bread, which shouldn't aggravate her condition. It's taken me so long to cut all of that unknown food out. The thought that I have to cede control of that and start putting it back in was actually really frightening. But I'm going to try them in small doses, um, say on a Friday night, when I don't have to see anyone till a Monday, um, and see how I get on with it. Like many people, Ellie consulted the internet to get medical information. And while that's empowering to an extent, what she lacked was a broader specialist perspective on her problem. And now she's got that. The next patient into the food hospital suffers from a condition thought to affect up to 15% of the adult UK population. My name is Michelle Jordan. I'm 30 years old. I live in Cosh and Portsmouth and I have gallstones in my gallbladder. If I eat particular food, I get pains in my chest. It starts with this weird feeling in my stomach, then it just slowly rises up to around here, and then it stays there. And then I can't breathe, I can't move, I have to just lay and wait for the pain to, to disappear. Around one in three people with gallstones develop difficulties. Symptoms include sudden and intense pain in your abdomen, nausea and vomiting, and yellowing of the skin and whites of the eyes. The source of the problem begins with the liver, which secretes bile into the gallbladder, a small organ located under it, which is used to break down fats and aids digestion. Gallstones occur when this bile becomes unbalanced, normally with too much cholesterol, and starts to form crystals which grow over time into stones. Millions of us have them without knowing it, but when they grow too big, that's where the problems start. I've been through child labour and I'd have that any day over this sort of pain. It'd be great if all I had to do was change my diet instead of having to go through surgery because having surgery is time off work, it's also time away from my child, which I don't want, and I won't be able to be as mobile as I am now. Having been hospitalised three times because of the pain, Michelle has come to see consultant surgeon Shaw Summers in the hope that he can alleviate her agony without resorting to surgery. This is a gallbladder that's been removed from somebody with an operation, and there's all the little stones, lots of different sizes, swimming around in the bile there. I've got a display case of a number of different sorts of gallstones here, from the really big ones that oh, have taken God. many, many years to form, to the sort of sludgy gravel. When you have fats with your meal, the gallbladder squeezes concentrated bile down the bile duct into the intestine. If the gallbladder squeezes and one of those stones gets caught in the outlet pipe of the gallbladder, 
the bile won't go anywhere because it's blocked and the gallbladder squeezes really hard and that's what causes the symptoms, that pain in the top of the tummy after a meal, especially worse if you have something fatty or rich. Okay. When gallstones get too big, surgery is the recommended option. 50,000 people need to have their gallbladders removed each year. But Michelle has come to the food hospital just in time. Shaw has run tests and the results show that rather than fully formed gallstones, she has the small sludgy crystals which have the potential to be reversed through diet. What we're going to do, Michelle, is to give you a diet that helps to make the bile a bit more runny. And the idea is that with runnier bile, the crystals might dissolve and your symptoms get less frequent, hopefully go away. How long do you reckon that would take? It might take a few weeks, it might even take a few months. It does depend on how runny the bile is and how dissolvable those crystals are. Unfortunately, modern day eating habits, foods are out of a box or they've been processed somewhere and prepared for you. And that processing leads the foods to make the bile very concentrated. The diet we're going to use is something called a Neolithic diet. Um, it's akin to what we used to eat in Stone Age and it, it consists of unrefined foods. Shaw and Lucy believe that a large amount of refined or processed foods may lead to the formation of gallstones. Evidence shows that a diet high in fat and cholesterol and low in fibre increases the risk of this condition. Our consumption of refined sugar has rocketed over the past 200 years. Research has shown that the equivalent of 40 grams, which is really only about eight teaspoons throughout the day, can actually double the risk of symptomatic gallstones. So it's quite a significant impact there. Instead, Michelle's Neolithic food plan involves sticking to unrefined foods. Those high in fibre will help prevent the concentration of bile and vitamin C, and low-fat dairy foods can also be beneficial. This Stone Age type diet is also thought to lower your risk of developing heart disease and one limited experimental study found a link to certain foods that may trigger gallstone pain. Have you found any trigger foods that set off pains? Oranges, Oranges? apples, apples? Yo some yogurts, okay. or curries. Curries, oh, well, that's very interesting. In this study, they also identified oranges and apples. Well, there you they go. did, they did. They also identified eggs, baked beans, things like onions, in some people coffee, but all of this is very individual. And what we wouldn't recommend is that somebody that's getting this type of pain just take all of them out of your diet. But you might obviously want to keep a bit of a food and symptom diary to see if things are occurring that trigger your symptoms, like you with oranges and apples. As well as eliminating possible trigger foods, Michelle will receive a list of recipes that include approved ingredients. Food treatment plans are specifically tailored to our patients. If you want to treat your condition with food, you should ask your GP to refer you to a dietitian. Lucy wants to show Michelle a simple example of one of the dishes. So what I thought we would cook is a nice family-friendly recipe, which is basically a burger. Okay. Obviously, this isn't just your typical standard burger. It's the burger with a twist. Okay. Lucy starts with a whole grain bun, rich in insoluble fibre. Lettuce adds crunch and tomato is high in vitamin C. The burger is made from a mix of kidney beans and chickpeas, full of plant sterols, also thought to help reduce cholesterol. Not that bad, actually. Surprising. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad it's not absolutely terrible. Sorry. <laughs> Michelle will return in six weeks to see if she can avoid going under the knife. It's a huge change from my current diet, but I'm willing to try things. If I don't put my all in, I'm going to have to have an operation, and I don't want an operation, so I'm going to do this diet. Simple. Sixteen-year-old Toby is desperate to rid himself of his severe eczema so that he can confidently apply to become airline cabin crew. He's been following a strict elimination diet for the last four weeks, but some of the recommended ingredients are proving a real challenge. Normally, uh, I'd probably be eating a packet of crisps or some biscuits, except for a buckwheat pancake, but, um, but never mind. It smells, it really smells. <laughs> Ah, that was quite good. Well, it's very tough. Pancake. 
That's disgusting. Next. Oh. It feels like I'm eating like a bit of soil or something. That is horrible. That is disgusting. No. Don't like it. <laughs> they said, like, have this as a snack or for breakfast. And um, eating this every breakfast would make me dread mornings. It's, it's revolting. I don't know if my willpower is that good to, to maybe, like, have one bit of toast. Because... Um, my, my patience is wearing a little bit thin right now. Toby's got another two weeks before he returns to the food hospital. Will he be able to stick to his plan? I'm Dr Pixie McKenna, and I'm investigating the truth about health claims made on food packaging. Cereal that lowers your cholesterol, juice packed full of antioxidants, and bread that keeps your heart healthy. It appears that well-designed packaging outlining healthy ingredients helps sell products, makes us believe they're better for us and convinces us to pay more. But are these health claims true? I've come to see dietitian and nutritionist Nicole Barbarian to find out. I guess what I want to know from you is, can we trust these health claims? A health claim is any statement which associates use of a product with a health benefit, such as lowers cholesterol or supports the immune system. But you can't just put any claim onto a product. It has to pass rigorous scientific testing. The European Food Safety Authority is an independent food body which investigates every health claim made on packaging and ensures there is sound evidence to support it. I want to look at a specific example. Will this cereal lower my cholesterol? Well, this product contains a substance called beta-glucans. That's a type of soluble fibre that has actually been found to lower cholesterol. So, yes, it does contain the substance that has been proven to have the health benefit. But the question is, can we get it elsewhere? Because beta-glucans are actually found naturally in oats and barley bran, having a standard bowl of oats maybe adding some extra oat bran to it as well, you're going to get quite a large amount of this beta-glucan, maybe up to two grams. The science says we need three grams per day of beta-glucans to start to see cholesterol lowering. Optivita has one gram per serving, so you would need three bowls per day. So the claim is true, but that's not the whole story. Nicole thinks it might be easier to get the three grams using porridge oats and bran. So for the consumer, there are much cheaper products on the shelves that do the same thing. Well, the branded product does have the benefit of having the added vitamins and minerals, but from the cholesterol lowering point of view, yes, there are other basic products which do the same thing. To most of us, food labelling is really, really confusing. I mean, you've got your low fats, rich in antioxidants. You know, what do we look out for when we go shopping? It is a minefield. As soon as fat content is reduced, for example, they might add more salt, more sugar, more artificial sweeteners to get the same taste and texture. So you've got to look at the labels. To make informed decisions about a product, you should always look at the bigger picture. The best thing to do is look beyond the claims on the front of the packaging. Go straight to the ingredients and recommended daily allowance information where you can get a clearer idea of what you are eating. You may be surprised at how little difference there is between foods that carry claims and those that don't. Health claims on packaging have to be rigorously checked and they also have to be proven to be true. But what I've discovered is it's always worth checking the ingredients. Packaging can make some foods seem healthier than cheaper alternatives. And when it comes to lowering my cholesterol, I've discovered that this cheap and simple bag of oats does the same thing as this more expensive alternative. 30-year-old mum Michelle came to the food hospital with excruciating pain from crystals in her gallbladder. She was prescribed a caveman or Neolithic diet in an attempt to avoid surgery to remove her gallbladder. The dietitian at the food hospital advised me to use more fresh produce rather than processed foods instead of using a jar of sauce to actually make the sauce myself which I've been doing and also I've got to have wholemeal pasta rather than the white pasta and wholemeal bread rather than the white bread. Sometimes it's difficult because after a hard day's work you're not that keen on coming and cooking from scratch but you do it and when you've done it you realise 
it didn't take that long, actually. It wasn't that bad. After eight weeks on her food treatment plan, Michelle is back for her follow-up. How have you got on with it? Surprisingly, not too bad. I've done everything I was told to do. I cut out all the bad things and kept in all the good things. Before she came to the food hospital, Michelle suffered around eight attacks of severe pain each month. Do you feel any better? I've had the pain once, which was at the very beginning of changing my diet, but since then I've had nothing. Well, that's really great. In yourself, do you feel better for having had this change in your eating habits? I feel less habit? hungry all the time, because I didn't used to have breakfast, but now I do, so I can actually last until lunchtime, as they say. I do feel better. It is very early days, but it's fantastic that you're feeling better and you're also adopting really healthy lifestyle practices because that's not just going to benefit your gallbladder. Of course, it's going to benefit your whole being. I'm really impressed how well you've done, Michelle. You've taken everything we've suggested on board and you've changed your diet. Hopefully, that will have taken the sludge out of your gallbladder but we'll have to arrange a special ultrasound scan to check whether that's really happened. If a future scan reveals her diet has reduced her gallbladder sludge, Michelle could avoid surgery. If we can carry on with this kind of diet, with this kind of lifestyle, I think the chances are I'll have to put my knife away. Well, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it is surprising that changing your diet would do so much, purely because I didn't think I ate that bad food, but obviously, just tweaking it here and there slightly has made a huge difference. It's been nearly three weeks since Ellie visited the food hospital and was prescribed her low choline food plan. Fish odour syndrome is not simple to treat as different foods trigger bad smells in different people. So Ellie's regime reintroduces her to certain foods one at a time to see which might give her an adverse reaction. I am still nervous about trying new foods, and particularly foods that I associate with having a bad odour, but I'm willing to give them a go. On the list today, we're going to try egg white omelette. Lucy wants Ellie to introduce more foods so she can eat a normal, balanced diet and return to a healthy weight. This is her first time eating egg whites in over three years. I'm really, really hungry. I'm really looking forward to this and it smells really nice. Actually, it doesn't smell eggy at all. It just smells like cooking. Mm, it doesn't taste too bad, actually. While it's essential Ellie identifies foods that trigger her odour, she still struggles with the psychological effects of her condition. There are things I'm still anxious about. I've still got the boundaries of things I know I won't try, or the boundary of things, I'll try this, but I'll only try it on the weekend. I did have a bad day last Monday, a very bad day, and I, I had to go and meet a lot of people for work. And I knew I was having a bad day, and that was very difficult. That was almost like just going back to the beginning of the whole process. Will Ellie manage to hold her nerve and keep testing foods that trigger her fish odour syndrome? And what will the results of the food elimination plan show for Toby's eczema when he returns to the food hospital? Eight weeks ago, 16-year-old Toby came to the food hospital with severe eczema on his hands and arms. Gio referred him to a dietary allergy specialist who put him on a strict elimination plan. And the results have been truly dramatic. Toby, what's happened to you? I thought you had eczema. Yeah, I know, me too. It's uh, disappeared. That is, <laughs> that is really very, very impressive. So tell me exactly what happened. You took some of the foods out of your diet. Yeah, wheat, gluten, um, milk, eggs, poultry, um, everything like that, really, and, f um, and fruit. And then how long did it take to start working? It was weird because first four days, um, it got worse. Then after the fifth day, uh, I started seeing a little difference. So then I was just like, maybe, you know, keep on going, keep on going. Uh, and by the 10th day, I saw a noticeable difference where other people could, like in my family, could like notice that it's going. 
Eight weeks ago, he was plagued by seeping and crusty lesions. Now, it is completely dry. Yeah. And it's 95% of it is completely normal, the odd little skin flake there, but otherwise it's very impressive and a really good result. I've never known my skin to be so clear um, in, in ever. I keep on using my hands in conversation. Like, I've like, keep on... Waving them around. Waving them about and they're not like always like tucked in under my jumpers or anything like that. So less self-conscious. Yeah. The next step is to reintroduce some foods into your diet. So are you looking forward to that or what are you thinking about it? I'm looking forward to it. Um, I mean, I'm looking forward to eating some foods that I've missed. Mm. Even if I find a food that doesn't work and makes the eczema worse, that's a positive because I know more about it. Toby had been worried that his unsightly and flaking skin would prevent him from realising his life's goal. In terms of your ambitions, wanting to be an air steward, yeah. how do you feel about that now? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and apply. Um, I just, you know, apply to every airline, that's, that's one thing. I feel like it's achievable, you know. Hopefully, one day, that it will happen. Well, this is very exciting. You must it's be... very exciting. Yeah, and you're pleased. I'm so happy. Yeah, well done you. Toby's skin has improved dramatically, and I'm very pleased about that. Exactly why that is, as a result of the elimination diet, isn't totally clear. However, it's a good example of how food can subtly affect the way our body functions. I feel so happy. Literally, I can't get this smile off my face. Um, my confidence has taken such a boost, um, and I feel that I'm not pretending to smile anymore. That I'm, it's not like a forced smile, it's just like on my face all the time. It's, it's great. Three weeks ago, Ellie came to the food hospital with fish odour syndrome, which made her feel like an outcast and was endangering her health. She's back to tell Lucy and Gio how she's coping with her reintroduction of foods to try to up her nutrient intake. Well, I've been trying lots of different types of foods that I was too scared to try before. Um, mixed results, some of them have actually caused a bit of an odour problem, but some of them haven't at all. So I've been going through the list and working out what definitely is a problem and what is definitely fine. But um, I'm really enjoying cooking and making food again and before it was just something I didn't really want to deal with. So do you yeah. feel that like your relationship with food is evolving for the good? Yeah it is. No, I mean my diet's still restricted I and mean, there's things I'm not ever going to have again like meat because I mm. know that'll be a problem. Um, but just a wider combination than yeah. what I was eating. I've been having things like bagels and crumpets for breakfast which I haven't had for a couple of years and Wow, having a comfort and jam and a bit of butter <laughs> for breakfast is... It's, I can't tell you the difference it's made to my um, quality of life. Ellie's previous diet was so restricted, Lucy and Gio discovered she was seriously underweight and probably malnourished. Here we are, three short weeks later, you've gained a kilo, which is actually over two pounds. And the best news is that within the bit of weight that you have gained, it's actually been lean body mass, it's been protein making oh, your muscles. <laughs> so you have yeah. more muscle, which is fantastic news, because obviously that's what I've been really concerned yeah. about. So your body is recovering. I'm so impressed in the transformation in just three short weeks. You've clearly really gone at it wholeheartedly. There's no point screwing up an opportunity like this. And I had no idea how miserable it was making me um, and I just felt like a completely different person. You do seem transformed to be honest, like you just seem like the curtains lifted. And yeah, like, that's how it feels yeah. um, and I'm stunned by that, I was, wasn't expecting that at all. Three weeks ago, food was the enemy for Ellie and she was doing untold damage to her body. I'm happy to say she's now enjoying food and still managing to control her fish odour syndrome. I feel like I'm getting my life back. I know I'm always going to have the condition, but I feel differently about it. And it's like the world's opening up again. And I know that sounds a bit unbelievable after three weeks, but it's really how I feel. Um, I've got so much hope um, and it's just amazing.